Richard, I'm so excited to share your experience with our TEDx audience today. So you had actually interacted with President Kennedy on a number of occasions. Is that correct? I did, uh, Stacy. I was very lucky when General Wheel moved from Fort Polk to Washington. He took me with him as his junior aide. So immediately after getting to Washington, the president and I, uh, the general and I, were introduced to President Kennedy. We actually went to the White House went into the Oval Office. He allowed me to sit in his rocking chair while he and General Wheel talked. And uh, so that was our first introduction to the president. And you would provide him briefings? We did. Uh, when we'd go to the White House, generally General Wheel would go to Andrews Air Force Base or the Blair House, wherever the uh, people were from, the kings, queens, head of states, premiers, and he would bring them to the White House. In the meantime, I would go to the White House, take a briefing book to the president. The president was amazing. I could give him a book from 60, 80, 100 pages. He would skim through it, and within a minute or two, he would hang it, hand it back to me, and he could just tell me what was almost on any page. He was a speed reader. He had a photographic memory. He was a historian. He looked to the future. The, the guy was amazing. He had vision, but he just, he was totally uh, uh, absorbed any reading material immediately. And he That's was incredible. just totally brilliant guy. Now, General Will and you as his aide de camp were responsible for state funerals. Should either a past president or a sitting president die, which meant the minute that the bullets hit President Kennedy, you were in charge. So where were you when you got the news? We had taken General Wheel to the office in the morning, and we had come back to his, uh, to his house at uh, lunchtime and dropped him off, went to our BOQ, had lunch, came back to his house, and the driver and I were standing outside listening to the radio. And we heard the news, my God, the president's been shot. So I started running to the general's house, and immediately he came out of the back door. We ran into each other. Have you heard the news, he said to me. We jumped in the car, headed out to our office at Fort McNair. Before we left Fort Myer, a red phone rang. Now remember, these are the days, <laughs> not the days of cell phones. And this is 1963. <laughs> And so the general picked up the phone, and it was Mrs. Lincoln, uh, President Kennedy's assistant, telling us to come immediately to the White House. Well, we started to the White House, a lot of traffic. We got to the White House in a pretty timely fashion. But by then, it was known that the president was dead. There was chaos in the White House. There was literally nothing we could do. So we headed over to Fort McNair, to our office, where we had a book that thick of plans to start going through the plans for a state funeral. So what was your role when the body is returned on Air Force One back to the Capitol? We had been notified about mid-afternoon that the body would be returned to, uh, to Washington about 6.30 p.m. So about 5 o'clock we left uh, Fort McNair and went to Andrews Air Force Base. And our, before we left, General Wheel reached in his drawer, pulled out two semi-automatic pistols, a 45, and he strapped one on me. And he said, now when we get that body off the airplane, don't you leave it until they bury him. And, and that was my marching orders. So anyhow, we get to Andrews Air Force Base. The body's coming off the airplane, and of course, the Secret Service and the FBI, they're all up there trying to grapple with the coffin to get it off the plane. And finally, they let our honor guard from the 3rd Infantry uh, there at Fort Myer, Arlington Cemetery, they let them get the body, get it off the plane, 
put it in this squatty little gray Navy ambulance, which we were using for a hearse, and we got the body in there. Jackie got into the hearse and then started uh, going to uh, the Bethesda Naval Hospital. And so were you in the ambulance or were No, you? actually, what we did, we got the body, uh, the, the casket into mm -hmm. the ambulance. We put our car at the head of the procession and then let it start to leave. And General Wheel, myself, and the honor guard from the 3rd Infantry, and also a Marine guard, got on this old Chinook helicopter, the double rotor helicopter, and we flew ahead of the procession okay. so we would be at the Bethesda Naval Hospital when the body arrived. General Wheel went to the front door to meet Jackie. I went around behind the hospital to the morgue with the honor guard so we would be there when the coffin got there so we could bring it into the uh, autopsy room. And so you were there for the entire autopsy? Uh, yes, I was. The autopsy lasted about three hours. We got the body uh, out of the uh, ambulance, brought it in, took the body, and actually it was myself and two technicians, lifted the body out of the coffin, put it on this cold steel table, took it out of the body bag, and then the first thing that happened with the course the Army and Navy photographers came in, took a lot of pictures. Then the x-ray machines came in, took a lot of x-rays. And then when they left, these two technicians and myself literally wiped the blood off the body and just laid the body out and prepared it for the autopsy. And I, I, I moved off, you know, as the doctors and the others started to come in for the autopsy, which lasted three hours. Now, the movie Jackie portrays uh, the First Lady as bursting into the autopsy room in chaos and lots of individuals running around. Was that the case? <laughs> well, the movie Jackie nor the movie JFK, the Oliver Stone movie, neither one of them were very <laughs> accurate. Actually, uh, <laughs> Jackie, when she got to the Bethesda Naval Hospital, as I said, General Me Wheel met her at the front door. They immediately went upstairs. You know, Jackie was very sophisticated, very you know, attractive lady. She still had on this beautiful pink suit with the blood splattered on it, but she never came down out of the 17th floor. In the meantime, there was not a, there was not a lot of people in, in the autopsy room. There were the three doctors, a couple of technicians, myself, and every now and then an FBI agent or a Secret Service agent would stick their head in. But no, it, it was not a three-ring circus like it showed in the movie. So were you calling home to say, Mom, Dad, you're not going to believe what happened to me today? <laughs> well, actually... Uh, Stacy, I was sworn to secrecy. Uh, about three fourths of the way during the autopsy, a person for the State Department, State Department came in with a form, said, "Sign this," and it was a National Secrets Act form that said I couldn't say anything that I said saw it during the autopsy for 15 years under a penalty of $25,000 or 10 years in jail. So no, I couldn't say anything I saw, but at the end of the autopsy, when General Wheeler and I were going to leave to go change in our dress uniforms, I did grab a payphone, called my parents, said, guess where I am? And they said, we saw you on TV, where are you now? <laughs> I said, I'm at the Bethesda Naval Hospital. And, and that was all you could say. That was all I could say. Now, the, the um, autopsy is over, <laughs> and what happens then with the body? Okay, as soon as the autopsy was over, General Wheel and myself, we got in the, our automobile, drove back to, uh, very fast, drove back to our uh, quarters so we could change in our dress uniforms. We sent the driver to the White House, Jackie had called, and they had carefully laid out this beautiful dark suit, nice silk tie, white shirt, 
so on and so forth, picked that up, came back and picked us up. We went back to the hospital. All of that only took about 40 minutes. And then while General Wheel went back upstairs with Jackie to complete planning the funeral, and by the way, she was very focused from the moment she got to that hospital until this moment, it was until we left hours later, she knew exactly what she wanted it to happen during the funeral. But in the meantime, I sat there for another three and a half hours. We let unlock the doors, let Gawler's funeral home in, and for three and a half hours, I watched them prepare the president's body. You know, at the end of that, before we dressed him, to see the naked body, a perfectly fit president of the United States, not an ounce of fat on him, to see him lying there on this cold steel table. Uh, the, actually, the man from Gawler's funeral home and another technician that was there and myself, before we dressed him, we just had to take a deep breath and say, my God, you know, I'd never seen a dead man, and here I am looking at a man I know so well, the President of the United States, dead, and I may be the last person to see him. And we dressed him, and I helped the, all his funeral man lift him and put him in his casket, closed the casket before we started our procession back to the White House. And there was a mass held at the White House then? Yes, we, we, we put the body back in the ambulance, the coffin, uh, the, the new coffin. We went back to the White House and slowly we went into the White House. We took uh, the body, came in, I stood there at the entrance and sort of watched, oversaw things. As the coffin came in, then Jackie followed and came in. Then we went into the East Room. We put the casket on a catafalque, the same type of one that was used uh, by Abraham Lincoln in Abraham Lincoln's funeral 98 years before. And uh, the, the chandeliers were draped, a very somber scene. It was just myself, Jackie, Bobby, Eunice Shriver, four or five members of the White House staff, we closed the doors and had a, they had a private mass for Jackie, about, for the president, for about 15 minutes. Then Jackie asked us all to leave and she and the priest stayed in the room for about five, six minutes, no more than that. And then they came out and, uh, I think you certainly have the expertise in, in terms of the firearms, and you actually saw the bullet wounds on the president. There are a lot of conspiracy theories. What's your opinion? Well, I did. <clears throat> I, I, I watched the autopsy from a distance of about maybe two or three feet further than you or I sitting together on a little riser so I could see right down on it from about six or eight feet. And I could hear the doctors talking back and forth. And it was no question, there were two bullets that entered the president from behind, and it came out of a six, because they retrieved the bullet fragment, and it came from a 6.5 Carcana Italian rifle, the same type of bullets, that the shell casings were found on the sixth floor of the school book depository there in Dallas. So the doctors agreed, I could see it. There's no question Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin and the bullets did come from behind him and the rear. Uh, there were no other shots fired that day from the grassy knoll. And, and you know, it was a lot of imagination, a lot of people that saw and heard echoes, but definitely the shots were fired by Lee Harvey Oswald. So all these many years later, 
What has stayed with you, or what are your thoughts about what was lost? Wow, that's a really good question, Stacy. <laughs> I guess the fact that, first of all, John Kennedy was such a brilliant man. As I said before, he was a great historian, but he, he had vision. He looked to the future. He wanted to know what the world was going to be like. He wanted to put a man on the moon. He wanted to tear down the Ber Berlin Wall. He wanted peace in his life's lifetime. He, he was interested in what painters and writers and musicians had to, and philosophers. He was interested in what they had to say. I, I guess it's difficult to put it all together, but this was probably the most brilliant president in our lifetime, certainly in, in my lifetime, and I think in many generations. I can only imagine what the world would have been like if he would have lived. Uh, this truly was the end of Camelot. Thank you so much, Richard, for sharing your story with us.